There's honesty here. There's dishonesty. There's charged, prejudiced, racism happening. There's violence. There's a little bit of everything when it comes to Nana Kwame, but something I'm starting to notice with some of these reads that we've had of him is a lot of his stories deal, have you noticed, with with the, the disconnect between what we say we think we feel or doing and then why we actually are behaving and doing the things that we are. He really pulls in the brutal nature of humans and how we are dishonest and he's being honest in his stories of, of how things unfold for certain people in our societies today. And I feel like he hits it to the, the core of what I've said many, many times is I feel like there are two ways that we really communicate effectively. We communicate through our words, whether that be spoken or written or through violence. And he takes both of those and wraps them up beautifully in this opening story of his book. And I, I read it, and then I went and downloaded the book on Audible. Uh, we're not sponsored by it, but definitely get that and get it downloaded because it is such a, a – you can listen to it, and it just it, – it, 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 you feel. It just – it hits you in the feels. Mm -hmm. And I think that's probably what he's going for, right? He wants, he wants a reaction from the reader. Right, because we're trying to get to the core of there's violence between a dominant racial class and a marginalized group of individuals. And we're trying to understand what's what's with this violence behind the scenes, right? Because the, the core isn't something that we don't see, right? Like in reality, we see racial prejudice, where the idea is that there's been some violent act. And then that act is dressed up as to why did that person do that? So in this story, we have a man that uses he was protecting his kids, which he names like a hundred million times in the story, Tiffany and Rodney. <laughs> Tiffany and Rodney, over and over. Right, but he he brutally attacks five individuals of the marginalized group, five black kids, with a chainsaw. And, and we're gonna get into it, right? But but it's it's a dual story where on one end you have what is kind of the simplified uh, dressed up uh, courtroom drama. Right. Mm -hmm. About where you have the prosecutor and the defense, like, what, why did you do this? And he's like, well, my, my kids, Tiffany and Rodney, and he repeats that like five or six times. I had to protect them. This was for freedom. I didn't know what they were going to do. They're probably going to cause some harm. They threatened us. And you have a lot of conflicting information. And then the prosecutor's like, wait, so you were threatened. So you ran to your truck, came back with a chainsaw, chased down a little girl who's the smallest, who attacked you, a grown man with a chainsaw. For no reason. Like, something doesn't add up here. Exactly. This is a classic case of somebody that is trying to rationalize something that should be irrational. The murder, uh, period. But then the murder of children. And then on top of that, the extreme, violent, brutal murder of decapitating children with a chainsaw. It just doesn't seem like it's fathomable. Maybe somebody's run at you, you know, and you're defending yourself with a weapon. That's one thing. But as you pointed out, like going after, you know, young children, it it, just, it doesn't seem possible. And the courtroom is set up, I think, to be in that, you know, satirical manner, a dark, dark humor, satirical manner. But it, it really does come across to you I, I, as a reader, me, that... This is something that is, is true, and it even kind of points out that this is probably a, a representation, I felt like, of, you know, uh, what happened in Florida. Uh, so, you know, somebody that stood their ground and took someone's life, and then there was a trial, and they got away with it, and our society was kind of up in arms of, like, are you kidding me? Like, he, th this was not self-defense. This was this was manslaughter at, at best, but murder probably at worst. Well, you'll notice you said this man— in the story, he's what George Wilson done. Like, he gets the three names. John Wilkes Booth, Lee Harvey Oswald. Like, there's a long-going thing with murderers, like assassins, having three names. And you could say it's to differentiate them from someone who might have the exact same name. But when you use those three names, you immediately start to feel this evilness about them, right? And Nana Kwame knows how to write that into the story, too, because... Maybe I'm misremembering this, but didn't the defense call him like Mr. Dunn or George Dunn at one point? Like they tried to humanize him, which we see in the news, right? Like 
when, when we think there's like this assassin or something like that, we'll use the three names. And then when we try to humanize them, we start dropping those three names and calling them just Mr. or the, just the first two names. And I think Nana Kwame represents that too with, with how we use words to even um, disassociate ourselves with, with being like them in some regards. Like, like me, I don't have three names, right? Like I can't be called that. I'm only three names when I'm in trouble, right? <laughs> like, like we see how that can like kind of impact even just like the listener. Nani does a great job of really using words as power tools. And that, that's what they are, right? And no pun intended for the story. But he takes them and gives you this idea of what a defense would lead you to believe and what a prosecution would lead you to believe. And it, you can see it play out just like if you watch any of the shows on TV of how, what this would look like in a courtroom. And for me, the whole time I'm hoping, and, and again, if you read the story, you know that we already know the verdict that George gets acquitted. He, he's found not guilty and it breaks um, the hearts of many people in the story because it's happening kind of told in the past in conjunction. But the whole time I'm hoping that it was a lie and that we were told wrong information. And I'm just, I'm, I'm saying there's no way, there's no way this is possible. And this really happened in our society. And I guess that's, this story is something that I believe for me is one of those quintessential stories that opens up the eyes of the reader to see past their own prejudices. It opens up the eyes of the reader to see past their own preconceived notions of what is right and wrong. And it really opens up the eyes of the reader to look past what really happens and question things. Question, question, question for the betterment of all people. Well, isn't there even also, if we talk about, you know, Du Bois, we talk about racial consciousness, about how some people have these similar experiences, right? And if we jump to Emmanuel's story now, if we can, we, we have a reaction, right, of these five people in this singular instance being mistreated. But you know it didn't start and stop here, right? The world didn't start and stop with George Floyd, right? We have years in history of, of, of things where we should be asking these questions. And you know, even Emmanuel, like his father taught him, you got to keep your blackness down, right? My blackness is at a seven. I got to get it down to a four, right? This isn't like a new trauma. What's different, though, is this naming this time where they're giving a voice to the trauma, right? Where these five individuals went through this experience because they were black is, is, is what we're meant to believe. Well, now we have Emmanuel, we have Boogie, other people who are black who are experiencing that trauma because every day... Am I going to be the next Finkelstein Five? Am I going to be the next person on the news that's going to get mistreated just because of what I wear? You know, you got that song Black Hoodie by Body Count, like if you've ever listened to the metal band by Ice-T, right? You know, just because you dress a certain way, that, that doesn't mean like, like you need to be treated that way, right? And that's what this, this shared trauma is happening in this story, where all of them are like getting this call to, hey, words aren't enough anymore. Like violence is the next answer. And you see the way that Emmanuel is like, he's like pulled to the bat. He's pulled to, to Boogie and his friends who are going to go out and do a name because now violence is the answer for how we're going to respond to this. That's what it comes back to is violence perpetuates violence. We've said many times an eye for an eye makes the whole world blind. And I think that Nane does a great job of showing that somebody has to break the cycle, but it's going to have to be both sides because one side can't hold up their end of the bargain of, of being good in society or being righteous in society or following the rules of what been set down by the other side and then be torn down as a result. And it, it breaks my heart that the part of Emmanuel's story is almost more heartbreaking than the Finkelstein five themselves, because I've seen that. Uh, and I've seen that in my own family where the blackness had to be dialed down. And then I've seen the, the blackness dialed up and it's like, wow, it, it's really different how people have to behave of, you know, how they have to hold, you know, slunch their shoulders, you know, so they don't look intimidating, uh, you know, and try to be shorter or change, literally change their voice of how they speak or the, their speech patterns or what words they will use. And 
that's heartbreaking because you're changing who you are to try to fit in society and then you're not even accepted because Emmanuel, he goes to the mall and he tries, you know, to buy some clothes and he's treated differently because of how he dresses, you know, because we, we, we judge the book by the cover and then we judge skin color even more so than anything else. What do you think, you know, so his friend Boogie, he has that speech about the wake up, right? And he, he Boogie's a, a product of violence, right? It's, it's these, these groups are being pushed and now they're finally pushing back. And, and Boogie talks about how like we, my job is to wake people up. Right, that it, it, you almost get an idea of remember um, the the mask we wear by Paul Lawrence Dunbar, the idea of performance for who when like a marginalized group is vi you know has violence struck upon them, that sometimes they have to put on this mask to appease the dominant uh, racial class, right? And here you have Boogie that's trying to wake people up. This is where I disagree with how they should go about it, because I, I don't think that violence is the answer. Uh, you know, uh, I know that I like the bad ending sometimes, but I'm, I'm a big teddy bear at heart. Uh, I, I'm a lover, not a fighter. I, I think that love wins out. And for a minority to try to overcome with violence is, is never going to be the solution. It's never going to work. Uh, we've seen that too many times throughout history where you have to have people coming together in solidarity. And maybe that's the hope is that you, you think Emmanuel is going to uh, bring Boogie out of the violence, but then Emmanuel is dragged into the violence and they go out and commit this crime because they're trying to retaliate for the Finkelstein five. And um, many people uh, are going out and, and killing people of other races uh, violently and brutally. And they're thinking that this is going to be the solution, but it, but it's not. Uh, I, I think that Boogie has, his heart's in the right place, sort of, but his means of execution is wrong. And uh, I mean, how, how many times do you sacrifice your children? How many times do you sacrifice yourself uh, before the other side wakes up? I mean, I get, I don't get where he's coming from, but I can empathize where he's coming from, that he, he wants this perpetual violence to stop so does, does does fire bring more fire i feel like it does uh and and i don't know if there is a solution yet um besides the hope of people just learn to love each other for who they are and stop judging one another well do you think there's symbolism in the name emmanuel because right because there's that scene where the violence is happening they're doing the naming against the couple in the makeout spot uh fila fellow st jones and basically, it's when the white girl is, you know, she's being beaten brutally and, and she starts to say the name, which I think is symbolic. I think it's a symbolic referencing of trying to cross the, the racial line there. And there's something that like changes. Would you call it an epiphany where he stops Boogie and, and almost stops the violence at that point in time once... Once there's a hand stretched out across the line, is that being too optimistic? Or how did you take Emmanuel, the name, being the one to stop the violence at that point in time once that racial line was crossed? I, I want to be positive about it. But again, she only got there when her life was threatened, the, the, the girl that is about to be killed. I mean, is that what it takes? You have to be on the precipice of death before you will finally change and become a better person. Like I would, I would hope that we could do, we, 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 we could not have to have that happen. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Emmanuel means, you know, God with us. Right. And there's that idea that he comes to, to sacrifice himself for the sins, right? Like at the beginning of Matthew, there's even that line where they talk about Jesus for he will save the people, his people from their sins. So we clearly have sins being committed of violence. Uh, I think most people would agree there's a morality line that is crossed when you murder, when you, when you brutalize, when you abuse other people. Most people agree that that's crossing a boundary. Do you think that this is Boogie's journey? Or is this Emmanuel's journey? Or is this the start of a societal change that does have to come within? Even no matter how poorly you are treated, you have to accept change first before society is going to accept change, which is going to be slow. 
We know that for sure because it's been taking a long time, but maybe one day we'll get there. Well, you, you bring up a good point, right? Society is a collect, like, it's an aggregate of individual choices. And, and that aggregate, oddly enough, weirdly enough, influences those individual choices, right? It's, it's this weird reciprocal nature. Yeah, vice versa too, yeah. Yeah, well, and at the end, you know, you've got division because, okay, so if for Emmanuel to say, my blackness is at a seven, that assumes his blackness means there's difference. It means that he has to be racially and consciously aware of it, right? While some people have the privilege of not even being aware of caring it, that's that's a burden that he he bears where he's got to be aware of how much his blackness is showing, right? So so the fact that there is a scale, one, shows that there's a difference, and two, shows that you'll be treated differently based on that. Yes. And, and it, it shoots up to a 10 at that point in time, if you recall correctly, particularly when the police arrive, right? And it, it's at the very end, you'll notice, where he finally reaches zero. To me, this was them reaching that unity, that idea that, we don't have to be treated differently, that we can be uh, tr looking at each other as individuals as opposed to an aggregate and assigning too many values on those aggregate values, if that makes sense. Oh, see, so, to I me, it's a, so, so to me, it's a manual story. And, and I'd love to hear a little bit more about why you think it might be Boogie's story. Boogie lives. This is this is. Boogie's going to change because he just sees his friend die. And I guess I, I took it as negative that Emmanuel goes to zero because he's killed. And that is the only way that the, that he's seen as acceptable is dead. And I just, he, he, I, I took it very negative. I, I went, I went very, very, uh, bad oriented to, to this, um, that, that Boogie now sees that Emmanuel save the girl and then lost his own life as a result, then maybe Boogie can be redeemed, and his voice of waking people up is not going to be through violence, that t to save somebody is the only true way in, in order to in, in order to move forward and really make a change in society as a whole. Is there any discussion about him being the Jesus-like figure, dying for other people's sins, like we talk about with the meaning Emmanuel, uh, that he has to die to save the others? Yeah, yeah, that's a that's a great way to look at it. Yeah, he's the Jesus-like figure, and uh, now Boogie will be one of his disciples to go, you know, hopefully move the message forward in a more positive manner. Well, it's it's like we said, love, unity, call to violence, racial consciousness, um, awareness and power structures. Uh, the, the, Nana Kwame can just jam all of that in a story, a powerful story that you feel and... You know, this isn't our first Nada Kwame. It's not our last Nada Kwame. He's got a full book that we have to explore. But yes. we're working through. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're working through Friday Black. If you want to join us in the playlist down below, sorry for being in a hotel room this week, but hopefully you'll enjoy some of our other recordings there. Uh, what did you guys think of this story? Did you feel it? Did you hate it? Right? Did it make you feel something? And is that hate a good thing? Right? Did it make you really rethink your your stance and prejudices or, or expectations? of people in society. Let us know in the comments down below. Uh, we're gonna continue through this collection and I hope you join us on that journey. My name's Benuna, peace. Be kind to each other, peace.